It's a mean age. But it is going to be a beautiful future as long as we don't f*** it up. I'm Brian McWilliams, and this is Mean Age Daydream, where I bring you unfiltered comedy, criticism, philosophy, and politics with a Mean Age Daydream. What is up, sweet apple dumplings? Welcome to Mean Age Daydream. I am your beautiful host, who is unbelievably exhausted today because my little baby girl, my six-month-old, has decided, for whatever reason, that she will no longer sleep through the night. And for the past couple of days, she has woken up at like midnight and then 4 a.m. And then when she's up at 4 a.m., she does not fall back asleep because now she has found her voice. She's like those little lefty kids in college. She's found her voice. She's found her truth. And her truth is screaming at four in the fucking morning for an hour, which is what has happened the last two nights. So I look like hot, warmed over dog shit. Welcome to the show, dog shit and you. How to look like shit and still maintain your podcast with me, Brian McWilliams, your adorable host. Yeah, welcome, guys. So, yeah, well, I'm going to try to keep it coherent. I'm going to do my damnedest, but it's definitely going to be a short show because I am uh, I am dragging. It has been difficult, but I just said, you know what? You ain't going to feel no better. Just get it done. <laughs> just get it recorded. Just throw it out in the world. So here we go. Now, today, I want to talk about... The Trump indictment stuff, I'm not going to go super deep, hardcore into it. A lot of people have already broken it down, but I'll give my take. And also, uh, we can chuckle a little bit at the proposed barriers and precautions that New York City is taking because I thought they were pretty funny if Trump should get indicted. But before we get into that, I saw online that some you know left-wing BLM guy was talking about how we no longer can say woke. Because woke is apparently equivalent to the N-word. Now, no matter my, what you might think about the word woke, whether or not it's easy to define, whether it's difficult to define, I would say woke is an ideological performance art in the effort to virtue signal to others that you may want to impress or feel like you are within their group to signal that you should be accepted, that you should be promoted, that you are, in fact, a morally comprehensive individual, regardless of the outcomes, regardless of whether or not that morals stays within what would be traditionally considered a good of society and results be damned. That's, that's more or less my definition of woke. You can tie a little bit more of that into jumping on whatever the cause du jour may be. Because woke is also on the forefront of whatever activist trope seems to be thrown out there. But to say that woke is some sort of slanderous hate term is like anything else, a effort by people on the left to portray anyone on the right who dares to question the orthodoxy as hateful, as resentful, as spiteful, as people that should be unpersoned and thus should not be listened to. It's a tale as old as time, really. I mean, I talked to Jeff Deist about this, how a lot of the times you see this play out within the trans world, uh, that people change the pronouns, they change the descriptions, they change uh, the words that you can and can't use, can and can't say, they redefine everything at a frenetic pace. And this is not because they're, well, partially might just because there's a little bit of scatterbraining going on, but I think it is intentional because it succeeds in making it easy to dismiss people. If you don't know the latest orthodoxy, you don't know the latest lexicon, well, then you're an idiot. And not only that, it's not because you're simply ignorant or you're slow on the uptake. It's because you're hateful and spiteful and you're doing it out of malice right? Not out of just confusion as to what you're actually supposed to be saying you're doing at the time. This effort is in that vein to say, well, you can't say woke because it's the equivalent of the N-word. No, no, you can say woke. 
Because you're describing, when you say woke, as you said, you're describing what I had defined as woke or many other definitions, but they all resolve or all revolve around typically the same general concept here. We're describing the same person. And while some people might find it hard to describe or define woke, we all know what it means. Now, the argument here, I guess, is to say, well, we all know what it means. It's a certain type of person, just like when you drop the end bomb we know what you're talking about. You're talking about Jim over there. He's that N-word, and we know exactly what you're talking about with skin color, right? Okay, no. Bullshit. Because skin color is not an ideology. Well, actually, maybe it is now. We, we seem to have made skin color into an ideology, right? Because you can redefine your gender, and people joke about redefining your skin color, but you do have people out there that have successfully done it. Um, I'm totally blanking on the name of the gal that pretended to be black and was like pretty high up, I think at the W, the NAACP. And now I think he's doing porn, like legitimately on OnlyFans doing pornography. <laughs> so kudos to her. I mean, hey, talk about taking a weakness and making it into a strength. But point being, when you talk about the N word, it is a slander based around a, a, a definitive skin color. And there are other ways that you can go about saying it, that it is unpopular in society, right? Because it was used and traditionally used to suppress a people, right? To describe a people that were used as chattel and, of course, made into slaves. You can make the argument that the N-word should not be said in good faith. However, I would, of course, argue that it should not be a hate word. You should not be able to be uh, criminally liable for saying it, uh, nor should it be fully removed from any lexicon. When we talk about describing people as woke, well, no, you can't just simply nip in the bud a word you don't like because it is identified a capture and captured a, a quadrant of people that you identify as, and you don't like the fact that they don't agree with your ideology. You can't just say, well, this is equivalent to that. It's, it's just like calling people the N-word just because you feel that you're being persecuted by people on quote unquote the alt-right or people that are on the, uh, the fringe of society as you define them, which is anybody left of, say, I don't even know, uh, or anybody right of, say, uh, Tulsi Gabbard, who now is even herself considered far right. You can't simply say that you're not allowed to use that phrase anymore and make the comparison because it is a purely defensive maneuver. It is only in the lexicon because it has been so effective in describing your shitty philosophy and it pisses you off so badly that now it has elicited this response. But it's not being used to suppress you in any way. In fact, the exact opposite seems to be true that the most woke among us have been gifted so many opportunities, so much funding. I mean, look at what's going on with ESG, that the benefits in academia, the benefits in the, in the scholastic realm, in the political realm, in any social field, in uh, virtually anything having to do with uh, the green energy movement, anything having to do with, uh, any, with feminist movements, I mean, the entertainment industry, all of these things have benefited the quote unquote woke ideology. And just because that has elicited a response from people doesn't mean that you get to ban the word because it has been so incredibly effective in defining what you are and evokes an instantaneous response from people, which is, fuck that. All right, that was a good ramble on uh, woke versus the N-word. We'll see if that makes sense tomorrow. Uh, before I move on, guys, if you like rambling, you can go and join our Patreon, patreon.com forward slash Lions of Liberty or lionsofliberty.locals.com. And you can join and get my good morning rants. Good morning fuckhead is what they're called. I do them uh, more or less every day of the week. Yesterday, I recorded one, got wrapped up in uh, car hunting, forgot to post it. Of course, was also very tired. And here we are coming back around today. Made sure to get one out there for the people. But you can support us as little as five bucks. We're going to be doing a live watch of Velocipaster at the request of Maurice, one of our Nittany level patrons. You can actually produce a show. And he asked us to do a live watch of Velocipaster, a movie about a pastor and ninjas and a Velociraptor. So we're going to be doing that live watch where people can watch along with us tomorrow. Please join us for that. And of course, all the other benefits like secrets, lies, and cover ups, early access to our interviews, bonus clips, etc. So please do check that out. Okay, so let's move on to this Trump indictment thing, right? First and foremost, it is absolutely absurd that this is even being brought to the forefront. Now, many people, myself included, think that this indictment is so transparently idiotic, so transparently politicized 
that it will do nothing but galvanize a base around Trump, which he may have not had in the past. And in truth, maybe one of the few things that actually could provide a new campaign baseline for him to springboard off of in a race against Biden, should he get the nomination. And I think this would actually help cement that for him. Because before Donald Trump ran on this platform of, I'm going to drain the swamp, right? I'm uh, the guy that's going to fight for you. You know, there's a machine out there and I'm going to stop the machine from eating you alive, yada, yada. He got into office, (laughs) did a terrible job at dismantling the deep state. Among many things, he did a bad job on. Uh, Yet, one of the things he did do was expose the justice system as being very, very politicized, especially when it's concerning the deep state. Now, I would argue that what COVID did for exposing medical fascism, right, and the big pharma agenda that is so prevalent in all of our politicians, in our uh, schools, in our medical establishments, all of the kickbacks, all of the the guiding guidelines that are laid out by the CDC and the World Health Organization, and this new absolutely unforgivably atrocious pandemic response act, which by the way, is just the next step towards totalitarianism, right? They're, if you're not familiar with this, they're doing an entire, you know, act that all of these world nations are agreeing on at the UN, which is essentially going to hand the World Health Organization control over our domestic responses should another quote unquote pandemic occur. Now, seeing what happened in the last quote unquote pandemic, which was really not a pandemic so much as a bad cold that was made 10 times worse by government actions. Well, I don't want them to have that power. I don't trust that power in any way. And considering the abysmal responses, abysmal results from the last lockdowns, shutdowns, uh, worldwide vaccine uh, rollout plans, why would you want to give these people more power? But yet that's exactly what they're pushing for. Thus, it is not a response. It is not a coherent and logical plan forward based upon success, based upon the experts being right, but in fact is simply a power grab to further cement what they want, which is, again, medical fascism. It is the easiest way to scare people into accepting an intergovernmental body that is overriding your rights in your domestic nation, and thus they're going to push this through at all costs. It's absurd and it's disgusting, but that's what's happening. Now, As I said, COVID exposed this, hopefully, to more people than just those watching this podcast. And if you're new to the podcast, welcome to the video cast, however you're watching this, however you're imbibing it. Welcome. Hopefully, you're getting some interesting points of view and perspectives. But COVID really exposed that agenda, exposed the absolutely incompetent medical fascist state for what it was. Trump, better or worse, has done that for the legal system in many respects. Because what we saw from the deep state, from these trusted government agencies that are supposed to be safeguarding our free, our safeguarding our way of life and our democracy, the FBI and the CIA and the NSA and, you know, any of these other four or three letter named bullshit organizations. Well, these agencies came out in mass, lied to the American public, Push forward a multi-million dollar investigation, which led to nothing, all the while basically standing in the way of the elected president doing his job. And in the meantime, causing an unbelievable amount of divisiveness, of hatred, of mistrust among the American population, none of which has seeded in any way, shape, or form. Now you've got Donald Trump coming back around again. And what do we see? Oh, Another trumped up charge, bad pun, but didn't intentionally mean to make it. Another charge being levied on him. Another, you know, grasp from the from the past, just like the Steele dossier, right? Which reached, reached into the past to find this nonsense information that was out there. Now, the Stormy Daniels thing, I'm not saying that it's nonsense or that it actually happened. Trump still insists that it didn't, and he just paid her to shut up and go away during his campaign. But there is something to be said that she may just looking be looking to get more credence for whatever she wants to sell or hawk or get the Stormy Daniels story made on Lifetime. Michael Cohen is clearly a criminal. He's already in jail, been convicted. And now you've got this new this story that's being trumped up again, a misdemeanor charge, which is essentially campaign finance, uh, you know, abuse or miscategorization, however you want to call it, of paying Stormy Daniels to keep her mouth shut, taken from the campaign funds. It's not a big deal. It certainly shouldn't be a federal crime. It's already been dismissed, as far as I know, in the federal courts. The uh, you know the federal uh, prosecutors decided, no, we're not going to follow this. It's not really worth anything. And yet you've got the DA of New York, or sorry, the uh, yeah, the DA of New York, pursuing these charges. It shows that there is such a distinct politicization 
of the justice system, that there is a prioritization towards political causes above what causes should be prominent in regards to the citizenry, right? Crime, um, whether or not that, that comes down to safety on the subway, safety on the streets, whether that comes down to, you know, the open air drug markets that exist, even though I'm for drug legalization, the problem I have is that they ignore, like in Los Angeles and New York and all these other leftist cities, they ignore violent dens of drug abuse, of sexual abuse, of uh, blatant criminality, as defined by the terms of, of, you know, our society at the moment, they ignore blatant attacks on private property rights and instead spend all their time on these bullshit political causes, on taking names off of, off of schools, of prosecuting Donald Trump for paying hush money to a, a stripper porn star. <coughs> now, this has laid bare the favoritism that's also played between how things are laid out, the, between the political elite and those which are not blessed to be considered within the system, in the machine. Bill Clinton's an obvious example. Hillary Clinton is, on, is an obvious example. Jeffrey Epstein is an obvious example. We look about how these people are prosecuted. I mean, Hillary Clinton famously had uh, her emails hacked, famously had shared information that she should have gone to jail for, if we're being completely honest, because she had shared classified information publicly. And it was on these, you know, these email servers that were not under government purview. They should be completely legal. She was not prosecuted in any way. She was not slapped others, even though Donald Trump led the lock her up chant, right? Didn't do anything about it. Meanwhile, there's like Navy servicemen on a submarine who showcase the fact that, oh, hey, look, honey, I'm on a boat, right? Takes a selfie on a boat and gets sent to, to prison for three years and dishonorably discharged. There's a very selective application to the law, and Donald Trump has really helped to make that apparent, all while making it very obvious which way the wheels of justice turn. So that is a definite benefit. Now, will the indictment help him in his cause? Yeah, I think it will. I think it, without a doubt, will galvanize Republicans. It'll probably galvanize some independents because like him or hate him, it does put the fear of what can be accomplished by a purely politicized justice system right in front of your eyes. And considering the things that we've seen over the you know the past uh, few weeks, even with the banks collapse, with the improprieties in uh, what's going on with you know FT or what is it FT? What was Sam Bankman Fried's uh, crypto thing? You know, campaign finance, mislocation, and misappropriation of funds, blatant fraud. But because he was such a giant donor to so many of these big Democratic organizations, it certainly seems like he's not going to get any come up and see there. Meanwhile, Donald Trump, former president of the United States, is being threatened with jail and a and a misdemeanor turned into a felony because again he paid hush money, which is regularly done. It opens up the question of what now constitutes these campaign violations, what constitutes quote unquote hush money, what constitutes anything. If somebody's trying to sue you, whether or not you believe that their, their case has merit, if you want to pay them just to shut the fuck up and go away, I don't know, you probably should be able to do that. I, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. It happens all the time. Corporations, again, selectively applied instances of law here, corporations pay people to go away constantly. They're settling nonstop on issues that are much graver than Donald Trump paying a prostitute to, to go away and not talk about how she fucked him or blew him or whatever it might be. These corporations pay people to not tell people how their insides melted into goo and came out of their ass. You know, they don't, they, to not talk about how their kids' eyeballs popped out of their head while they're eating their cornflakes in the morning because they ended up taking, you know, the wrong pill or the right pill that had the wrong side effects. You know, car companies like piece of shit Hyundai, which, you know, make people sign NDAs to not talk about their car engines seizing up on the freeway. We'll see what happens with that, with my story. I think that the indictment should have happened, and I don't know if it's going to. I still think that probably at this point in time, the New York, <coughs> excuse me, the New York AG is probably getting pressured from all sides to say, if you do this, it's going to really bite us on the ass. It's going to be a horrible thing. It's only going to help Donald Trump. We need to back off. And many things I think that you've seen do get adjusted accordingly because of Donald Trump and his influence. What people think might help or hurt Donald Trump. There's arguments to be made that the, you know, the COVID pandemic was uh, was played up more so to hurt Donald Trump, right? And then 
than uh, the Donald Trump's influence over the vaccine rollout, right, was considered a horrible thing, right? They downplayed how good the vaccines were when he was in there. And then as soon as he's gone, oh, the vaccines are the savior of humanity. Everybody take them, right? He's very selective. So I'm not, I'm not going to say that for sure this indictment's going to happen. I think more likely than not, it's not. I think that they know it's going to help them. I think they know they're going to take the, the foot off the, pe- the gas pedal there and that they're going to say, you know what? After reviewing this, we don't think we have a strong enough case. Now, that being said, Donald Trump has taken this, obviously, already as a campaign platform. He's already called for a protest, which was so stupid. Uh, uh, go on, go on, my opinions, my flying monkeys, and protest in the streets of New York. Now, <laughs> from this, the photos I've seen, 10 people were outside Trump Tower protesting. It was a big, you know, wet fart noise. But what I find is very funny is I read a story today that the New York Police Department has been putting up barriers around Trump Tower. They have 700 police officers waiting to undertake riot, you know, activity, riot breaking and riot control measures <laughs> should Donald Trump actually get indicted. In New York City, this is what they think is going to happen. They think that Donald Trump getting indicted and getting arrested is somehow going to inspire hordes and mobs of people, thousands and thousands of people to all of a sudden spontaneously, because again, no one knows if this is going to happen or not, to spontaneously rise up in New York City to drive to New York, because I'm, are you expecting me to believe that in New York City, there are so many Trump supporters that they need 700 riot cops and barriers? Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> it's just like, you know, I tweeted out, uh, is Jesse Smollett going to be leaving, leaving the uh, the riots? Is Jesse Smollett going to be leading the protests here? Because it definitely smacks of that, that kind of illusionary uh, performative aspect of what's going on here. And well, now we've got to set up these barriers because these mega people are going to come and wreck our city as fucking if. As fucking if, man. It certainly reminds me of, you know, after January 6th, the performative aspects of putting up the fences and the barriers around Capitol Hill. Oh, because, you know, they're so scared now that they have to put up these barriers. It certainly seems like that. It's something that the news can cover. It's something that New York City and the New York uh, political establishment, which hates Donald Trump and, of course, is very, very left. It's something that they know they can use and say, can you believe this man's calling for protest? Look what we had to do. We had to protect you by putting up these barriers because these animals are going to come in and they're going to tear the place down. It's just fucking fodder for CNN and MSNBC to pan over to show the cops and show the bears. It's all bullshit. It's all complete bullshit. But it certainly is entertaining. Uh, one more thing I want to cover, guys. And as I said, I'm going to wrap this It's going to be very short. I'm going to wrap it around 30 minutes. So I don't know if you saw this, but it was brought up on our uh, our call we do. We do a monthly call with our Mufasa members, $25 members. And Craig, a longtime supporter of ours, had brought up this issue of uh, the vote that, that got vetoed by Joe Biden, which was passed already. It was passed last year. So passed before all these Republicans were in the House. It was passed by a bipartisan... Senate bipartisan house saying that these investment funds, these pension funds did not need to go and spend their money on this ESG bullshit, which many times has not been profitable. You have, as I mentioned before on the show, you have uh, Vanguard pulling out of investing in, uh, in climate related stuff because number one, a lot of these are just not profitable. Number two, you see the risks involved when companies are focused on ESG and all these other causes like Silicon Valley bank was to the tune of not paying attention uh, to the actual bottom line, to not making money and keeping the solvency going to hiring people based upon check marks and quotas rather than, than talent. And they said, you know what, this is unnecessary. It's ridiculous to force pension, to force companies into investing in these companies. We are going to pass a bill that says you don't have to do that anymore. So what does Joe Biden do? Joe Biden vetoes it, saying that it was too heavily influenced by Republicans. And that's why, because they're fighting against climate and for the good of people. And how dare they tell people what these companies can and can't invest in? 
Now, clearly, Joe Biden's pandering to a certain portion of the population. I personally think that the tide is definitely turning on ESG and on diversity and inclusion. Uh, you're seeing many big companies lay off a lot of their D and I staff, the diverse or the D I E staff. Uh, a lot of them are getting away from these causes because they have proven to be not only bad investments, but bad for corporate culture. Um, you know, there's a lot of videos going around right now talking about whether, well, actually it's a fact people, in the HR profession, they did an anonymous survey and they said, look, hiring managers, are you more or less likely to hire somebody that has pronouns in their bio? And the answer was they were less likely to hire, hire people with pronouns. Why? For the obvious reasons you'd think. People with pronouns in their bios are going to be, and word alert, woke. They are more likely to be needy in the workplace. They are more likely to be uh, reporting things to HR. They are more likely to be a problem for that company to maintain its culture, a problem for that company as far as integration with these people. And also more likely than not, they're not going to be there for the long term because they are more likely to cause an issue where you have to be let go, where you have to have to uh, find some solution to a problem that, they, that they're causing. And then good luck getting rid of them because they're also far more likely to sue you if you actually, if you fire them for good cause, they're going to say, well, it's because I identify as a shmerm or whatever the fuck it might be. And now you got a lawsuit on your hands. So really there's not much incentive to hiring somebody that puts these, they, them pronouns in their bios and come across as one of these wokesters. So <coughs> it's interesting that Joe Biden is pandering to this extreme left side of you as the world seems to be pulling back and waking up to the fact that this is all nonsense. Uh, that it's catering towards an infinitesimally small portion of the population, most of which is people that are globbing on social contagion wise to the cause, not people that are actually belief, believing in the cause, not that are affected by the cause, not that are uh, legitimately trans in any way, shape or form or non-binary. You know, most of these people are not. Most of these people are simply looking to get the victim mentality, get more attention in a world that it becomes increasingly hard to especially with social media competition going on. And that's where people spend most of their time. So anything to get ahead, right? But the fact that he vetoed it was just truly despicable. And uh, what was kind of funny was I was asked if uh, the people that were pensioners, right? This is what Craig had said. He goes, do you think the people that are pensioners, do you think they're pissed off that he vetoed it? Because you know, if you're a pensioner, even if you're in a lefty union, you probably just want your pension secured. You just want to be making money, right? You just want to make sure that there's going to be something there in your account at the end of the day when you retire at 44, whatever these assholes get in the, in the public space of these unionists get. And I told him, you know, I don't think they're going to care at all. And here's why. Because even if they spend all this money on ESG nonsense and it goes tits up, these companies go bankrupt or that doesn't bring back real returns because they're distracted spending billions of dollars on these social causes. Well, guess what? If these unions are big enough and have enough power, which so many do, all that's going to happen is the government's going to bail them out anyway. And that is what always happens. So they probably don't give a damn. But I do give a damn, guys. I give a damn about you. I give a damn about this world. And I give a damn about getting... A good night of sleep tonight. I pray my child allows this to happen instead of hearing <laughs> for a fucking hour at four in the morning. It's, it's not fun at all. All right. And I also care about you sharing the show. Give it a like. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, please subscribe, please hit notify because we are slowly but surely gaining our traction back, guys, after being demonetized and shadow banned on YouTube. So please like, support, tell a friend about the show. Remember, <coughs> we've got multiple shows here. We've got my show on Wednesdays. We've got John Odermatt and Finding Freedom on Mondays and Almost every single Friday, we have meme wars, where it's just kind of a fun twist on what's going on in the world. A lot of libertarian memes, a lot of funny memes, but we talk through it as long as hit on one or two topics. Fun, short show to finish off your week. So give it a listen, guys. Hope to see you in the Patreon and somewhere out in the world. All right, from me, Brian McWilliams, from the Lions of Liberty Network, and from Mean Age Daydream, keep those very tired, very baggy electric eyes on me, babe, and keep that ray gun to my head.